This video is from my Most Important Cloud Concepts collection. If you'd like to watch the full series where I describe all concepts in a single video, check out the link in the description. Next, we'll be talking about infrastructure as code. Okay, and infrastructure as code, let's talk about the problem that it solves first before we actually get into it. You can probably guess what it means by the name, but let's just kind of chat about this briefly. So in the old days, uh, before infrastructure as code was really popular and was really a thing, like how would you provision, let's say a database, for example, right? You would log in to the AWS console, right? You go to the, the AWS console, you would sign in, you go to like, I don't know, the MongoDB or the DynamoDB section of the console, and you would like click a bunch of things. You click like create table, um, and then you would specify some settings, right? You would say, okay, this is my table name. Uh, you may create some monitors that are as part of this. You may start to like add data to it, right? So like adding data, um, you, maybe you come to add data. Uh, maybe you come back to this later and modify the configuration. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do in the AWS console, right? With regards to a particular resource that you're trying to create. So what are the problems with this, right? Well, problem number one is that it's easy to make a mistake. So it's, it's very easy to like fat finger something or oops, I accidentally clicked the delete button. Whoopsies. Uh, now my production application is down. Um, so it's easy to make mistakes, right? Another problem is that it's hard to replicate this setup if you need to deploy it to a new country or a new geography. So say your application initially starts in North America and then you're like, oh, well, my company is expanding and now we need to create this exact same table that I created six months ago with the same settings, the same configuration, the same everything but I need to go through the console and do this and it's gonna take a long time. So this is another problem with, with having to do these things manually, right? And there's a whole bunch of other problems related to doing things manually, but this, these are kind of the main ones. Uh, so you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Infrastructure as code gen generally refers to like taking this configuration that you've done through the console and instead of doing it through the console, you just write code. Right. You write a, a piece of code that you can specify all the different settings of this uh, piece of infrastructure. And then you can put this in source control. So you can put this in Git. Uh, you can have other people that are like reviewers to do code reviews to say like, oh, like Johnny is trying to add a database or change a configuration. Is this a good thing? Should we do this or not? Think about how this would work in the previous world. Like someone could just be messing around in the console and doing stuff and you would not necessarily know. Um, but essentially you define all this infrastructure through code and then you hand this code off to the different cloud providers. So cloud uh, providers and what they'll do is they'll read your piece of code and then go to the corresponding services and create that infrastructure as you specified, right? So you can kind of think of this as like this template that you define and you create through code, you hand it off to the cloud and they kind of go out to the separate services and make all this st stuff for you. This makes it a lot harder to make mistakes. It's no longer like someone just doing stuff in the console. It kind of has to go through code reviews and people looking at it, you know, assuming that you use the best practices. Um, it's also very easy to replicate because now if you have this kind of template that you just created, um, you can say, oh, I just want to add a new region, right? I want to like deploy this also in addition to uh, US East 1, US East 1. I also want to go to Europe, right? Or EU West 1 or these different regions that exist. And so it ve becomes very, very easy to clone this stuff. Uh, it also becomes very, very easy to actually write this stuff. Once you actually get the hang of creating infrastructure as code, it's very intuitive intuitive. Um, a lot of them these days, like there's a declarative and an imperative version of this uh, within AWS. Uh, so there's cloud formation or CF cloud formation. Um, this you, you use a template language, which is more declarative. So you say exactly what you want uh, and AWS will go out and create it for you. And then there's another one, which is called CDK cloud development kit. And with this one, it's more like a programming language. Uh, so you have access to things like for loops, if statements, you can create conditions depending on what region you're in, then you want to specify some settings or depending on if you're in beta or production or gamma or whatever it may be, maybe you want to set up the infrastructure, but with like a very low amount of resources so you don't incur crazy costs. Uh, so things like CDK allow you to do this. There's also uh, third party providers that aren't necessarily tied to a particular company. So things like Terraform um, and Terraform are um, they actually allow you to use different cloud providers using one programming language or using one solution. Uh, so Terraform can hook into Azure, uh, can hook into AWS, it can hook into GCP. Uh, this is why a lot of people like Terraform. 
Yeah, okay, you guys can still see this, great. Um, GCP, um, so this is another popular solution as well. However, if you're using AWS, I recommend CDK or CloudFormation, but CDK is definitely my number one choice. Um, so this is uh, infrastructure as code in general. This is the, the concept and the problem that it helps solve. Okay, let's move on now to the last topic for discussion. And for this one, we're gonna be talking about cloud networks, cloud networks. Okay, let's talk about a like traditional network before we had cloud networks, uh, just so I can show you a basis for comparison, right? Um, so in the old days, when you had um, a like a company that you joined, what you would typically do is they would have a data center, either a data center that they had physically in their building, or they contracted it out to some company that would have their own data center. Let's go with the first example. Let's say like, okay, physically in the building, we have this like server room, right? And in this server room, like we can put our instances in there, right? You know, we can we can add all our stuff in here, all our databases and everything. And then we can create like subnets, right? We, we can say, okay, these instances are gonna host um, application that's gonna be outside world facing, right? So like people from the internet are gonna be able to communicate with these instances and this application. But these instances over here, Right, these are, are private. So we're gonna put these in a private subnet. You probably have things like databases, uh, things like sensitive data storage that would live over here, right? Um, so this is kind of like a traditional network, right? And it usually revolves around these concepts of subnets, right? And then like security groups, which you say like, okay, these different types of instances are allowed to communicate with other things. Um, so security groups, as you would be able to say like, okay, this instance is allowed to talk to the database, but an incoming request, for example, cannot go from the internet to the database, right? You'd have rules that would specify that that is not allowed. Okay, so this is, it is a, a summary of the traditional model. Um, so let's talk about cloud networks and how this deviates, right? So cloud networks don't really have this problem, right? Well, they have this problem, but it's not really your problem in this sense. There's AWS data centers, right, that exist. And as we talked about, like AWS data centers can exist. Like there could be many of them that you potentially integrate with, right? Let's keep it simple and just say that there's one right now. But, um, you know, when you create a, a cloud network, so to speak, this all exists within the context of AWS or GCP or Azure or whatever, right? And essentially, if you consider this like uh, white square to be all of AWS, there's many, many different customers of AWS, right? There could be me, which is like here. It could be you. There could be many different customers, right? And what a cloud network allows you to do is it allows you to isolate yourselves from one another. So maybe this is me, right? This is you. This is Jeff Bezos. <laughs> that has his own cloud network, this is, I don't know, um, someone else, right? And what uh, a cloud network allows you to do is to isolate yourself. So you can say, okay, I'm gonna deploy my resources into my cloud network, right? And you can deploy your resources into your cloud network, also on AWS. But by default, these things are not allowed to talk to each other. So this is not allowed, right? Unless you, you specify, you say the rules. Similarly, these resources that you created are not allowed to receive outbound traffic or inbound traffic, excuse me, from the internet, right? Unless you say so, right? Um, so th there's rules that you can specify on your resources that you deploy into your cloud network that basically determine what it's allowed to talk to within your cloud network and also outside of it, right? So you can say, okay, um, there's me and you, maybe we're friends or you know we have a, a business relationship together. Um, so we're gonna connect our cloud network together and make it so that we can talk to one another, right? But I can still have stuff in my network that you can't see, right? That's private to me. And similarly, you can have something in your network that I can't see that's private to you. Um, so cloud networks allow you to essentially isolate your resources within your cloud provider, uh, and it's an additional layer of security that you can rely on. So that's it for the video. If there's any core concepts for cloud computing you think I missed, I would love to hear what you have to say in the comments section of the video. And if you liked, please don't forget to like and subscribe and share the video with a friend uh, if you enjoyed it. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.